cemeteries, places where there hasn't been large scale modification of the land. And that's that's just an example of some of the clearing. That's right down in Melbourne, right in the south, south part of Australia, where um, that's just a thing showing the um, continuing clearing of native vegetation and loss of native grasslands. So it's still a big issue. Um, we have laws for clearing controls, and, but it still happens. There's a lot of conversion of land to development to um, so the grasslands are, have suffered a bit in the south. Okay, so I'll just run through northern Australia, and I've written the world's largest intact tropical savanna. So it is largely intact, it's still there as a, as a native grassland. It's got a number of fruits and issues we'll go through. Um, but it's a huge, extensive area we work across. It's about 130 million hectares, or about, about 300 million acres. That's the area we cover in the work um, So just, and the reason, I just want to go through the climate because the, that map, the, the graph at the top shows a heavily seasonal rainfall. So those high rainfall months are in the summer. So you get very heavy rainfall in the summer and then a very dry period in the middle. So a lot of the area, when you look at it, was quite dry. The rain falls heavily, there's large floods in many areas and they, they run off. So the, the floods are very important for fisheries and for um, the ecology of the whole law. Um, but that pattern of rainfall makes it very difficult to do um, intensive agriculture or um, improved pasture management or anything like that. So it is an extensive grazing system. Um, and those two maps, that's the summer, for example, the summer rainfall pattern. So you, as you move inland, it gets drier and drier. So 30 millimetres, 1,000 millimetres and above for a top end, so that's what the 36 inches plus. Your summer, your summer to February? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and then as you move down, it drops off fairly quickly. And that's, a, that's an example of a, of a winter rainfall. So that's in um, almost June. So you can see there's almost no rain. So these are some of the typical landscapes across our savannah. So this is quite common, this sort of grassland here. This is in a dry season um, with mixed scattered overstory and eucalypt trees and other species. And then often you get these rocky outcrops in places which are quite important for biodiversity. And the mix is important. Um, there's wetlands scattered right across the north which are really important areas for Migratory birds and um, and the species that live in the, in the savannas, they're quite rich around the wetlands. Um, so. um, that's a that's a floodplain sort of landscape in the north, and that so that area I think I took that photo after there'd been a flood through that area, it stayed there for about two months. So you see. If you're running a cattle business, it's quite difficult. You have to get your cattle on the high ground, and they could be off there for quite some time. And it took that land several years to fully recover from the grassland from that. And all these, that's um, termite mounds. So termite mounds, there's a huge biomass of termites in the We don't have large um, grazing species, but the termites tend to do the nutrient recycling that probably the large animals do in a new landscape. Um, so they, they play a major role in bringing up nutrients from the, from the depth because they have an extensive system that goes right down into the ground and they, I don't know if you've ever seen on David Attenborough, he, you know David Attenborough, the nature, he crawled inside one once and he's taken photos because they actually they have an extensive um, air rating system that circulates the air and they cultivate the ants cultivate fungi for food down to the farmers and um, so they bring, bring nutrients up from deep in the soil. So it's equivalent to fertilizing um, 200 to 400 kilograms of thick there. So that's the, those um, termite mounds are common across most of the world. Um, so 
big river systems, um, but again, we have high flows in the wet season and much drier in the dry season. Um, important to the local communities, of course, and but they're quite dangerous as always crocodiles, um, floods and crocodiles are one. Things have to be careful, careful of in, that, in those rivers. So these are all rivers that flow north, north into the northern part of Australia. Um, important for biodiversity. The north part of Australia has about a half of the bird species in Australia. It's about 400 bird species and about a third of the mammal species. Um, a lot of them are grassland dependent, like the emu and the little finch, the gullion finch, is an endangered finch that's heavily dependent on particular types of grassland. Mm -hmm. um, the bustard, the one in the middle. Um, what is it? Bustard, it's like a plains turkey almost. Mm -hmm. it's silly, it's nests on the ground. Um, but it's also a favourite um, bush food for the Aboriginal people. It's very tasty. I'm, I'm told. I haven't actually tried one yet. Mm -hmm. um, and the Indies range extends to across the area. Um, and then there's a wide range of other bird species that live on the seeds or the, or the trees within the um, grassland. Now one's a glad, glass, and this one's a parrot. Mm. Or white parrot too. Um, there's a range of mammal species across the north, but mostly small. Um, that's a, a quoll, that's an endangered northern quoll on the left there. And they're a small, small mammal, cat like. Um, again, heavily dependent on the grasslands. Um, suffered a lot in recent years because changed bio regimes since um, Aboriginal learning stopped. And that's one of the issues we're dealing with. Um, and the predation by a range of um, introduced species. Um, what are the species that are introduced for the show? Uh, we've got a few on <laughs> Anyone you can think of. We probably said that. Um, the Stingo, Susan Navy dog that came in about 4,000 years ago. And then the range of wallaby and uh, kangaroo species that are the um, so there is a story of mammal decline, small mammal decline across in Australia, uh, which um, has got lots of causes, um, uh, mainly to do with fire, ferals, and weeds. And, uh, so the, the main ferals that are damaging is small mammals as cats, and the big problem is feral cats mm -hmm. escaped, um, and then animals like uh, pigs root on the nesting areas for and uh for the things like that. What's the reptile? That's a monitor lizard. It's a what? A monitor, it's cool. Oh okay. We had a goanna. Um they grow oh, okay. quite big and they're scary. Mm -hmm. Do they hurt people? They'll bite you if you annoy them. They're good food food. Okay. Um, again, <laughs> again the Aboriginal people ate them extensively. But they have declined badly. We have a cane toad, a toad that was introduced from it was a Southern American species that was introduced into Hawaii to control the cane beetle, yeah. and then it was introduced into Australia to control the cane beetle, which it failed to do, but has <laughs> spread extensively. It's spread rapidly across the country in maybe all the north part of Australia just about now in probably 20 years, and it's poisonous, so the small mammals eat it and die. There's some interesting research happening at the moment with, with the little quolls because they're such a rare endangered species. They've um, been doing some trials with feeding feeding the quolls um, sausages made up of ground ground up cane toad. Mm -hmm. So it makes them sick, but doesn't actually kill them. So then they get sick and they get aversion to the um, cane toads and they won't eat them. And there's some evidence they're passing that knowledge onto the offspring. That's the sort of research that's happening to try to find ways to deal with cane toads because at the moment there's no control of cane toads. So they're breeding their millions and millions. So nothing is able to successfully prey on it without. There's a several species of plant to flip them over and eat them from the belly. Um, the crows, crows have, uh, dogs, some dogs, um, a couple of other species of cane toads. Many species like monitors, like all our snakes, have declined badly. 
Um, okay, so these are the perils. These are some of the threats, the challenges for management that we face, trying to deal with. There's, uh, that's some examples of some of the feral animals, buffaloes, and um, Australia has no native uh, hard hoof animals. So cattle, horses, donkeys, goats, um, and buffalo do a lot of damage in the, when they're getting large numbers. And with the wallows in the, in the wetlands, they tend to destroy lots of the um, critical ecosystems. Wild pigs are probably one of our worst pests. Um, they bred up in huge numbers in many areas. And they eat turtle eggs, especially on the beaches. A lot of our sea turtles are in trouble because they're not they're, they're not surviving the nesting process. The turtles pick them up and eat them. And the same with a lot of the freshwater um, wetland species. And cats, the other big one. Cats, the biggest uh, number of species animals eaten daily by cats is in the millions across northern Australia. And, uh, and they're a very difficult animal to, to deal with in the extensive forest or across the grasslands. You just can't find them or find them or get rid of them. So they're quite a challenge. So some of the stuff is about how do you control their, their breeding and their hunting habits by fire management uh, and um, retaining habitat in places where small mammals can hide. How do you know who's? Oh, they're just um, house cats. Really? And they tend to breed up. Oh, bigger. Yeah, yeah, they're, some of them are pretty healthy. And they're good hunters. They're very impressive animals. Um, and weeds, we have quite a number of weeds across the north. Um, like that one over there is a tricky acacia that's came in from the Africa. It's a, good, it's a good grazing tree in Africa. It was introduced to Australia. And got and now natural predators. Um, that's Calatro, that's from South America. This is Billyac bush, which is also from South America. So we've got a wide range of weeds that are difficult to control over large areas. In some cases they push out native vegetation and change the habitat. So that's not everything, <coughs> but they certainly are the main issues. Uh, and that's an extreme example of erosion. We have very fairly poor soils, generally speaking, and some of them are highly erodible. So if you do the wrong thing, like you do bad overgrazing, or you get bad disturbance of the soil with um, pigs and other problems, you'll get very bad erosion, and that runs into the rivers and sits up the sits up the wetlands. So that's an extreme example, but this shows what can happen if you don't manage the land properly. Okay, so far as, far as the big part of the story in Northern Australia, so that's a, the map in the middle shows, um, shows fire history from 1907 to 2003. So you can see most of the fires in Northern Australia, most of the fires in Australia are actually in Northern Australia. It's a highly fire dependent community. And most of the fires you see on the news is these big ones in the south. So we'll get big wildfires in the more populated areas, like you do in California, um, which burn houses and threaten lives. So that's a big fire management issue in the forests. Because eucalypts are a very a fire loving species, <coughs> so adapted to fire. Um, but then also the grasslands are also adapted to fire, but they, they actually need a very different type of fire. So there's a bad fire and a good fire. So the bad fires are the ones that come late in the dry season, they burn very hot, sweep across large areas. So a lot of our work is about how do you restore good fire management through early through burning early in the dry season, so soon after the um, after the finish of the wet season. So this is drying out. If you burn at the right time, you get this sort of fire. This creeps through the landscape, and creates lots of different little patches of habitat and burnt areas, and um, that's what all the species and all are adapted. That's interesting because here the good fire is the more the hotter, the more yeah. intense. Yeah, no, I was just talking this morning. Yeah, that was as we drove around. And rather than the creeping fire, because the more intense fire burns all these shrubs and stuff, you know, and it really yeah. keeps down the more grassland. 
Yeah, it's very interesting because um, in the north, the graziers don't want to burn because they try to keep the grass right. grazing because they've tended not to burn early in the season. And then they, the downside is if you do get a fire, then it's a hot fire that destroys all your grass and it doesn't grow back here because it's so dry. It doesn't grow back to the next season. Whereas here, it sounds like you burn and then it grows. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's an interesting contrast. Yeah. Um, Spring, summer, winter, fall. They have four seasons that they experiment with the fires. Yeah. But the, they, they were just saying that the more intense hot fire uh, is better for the car users. Yeah. Now, they will, there will be a need for um, hot fires in some places in the, in the north. Some of those weeds can be controlled through a hot fire. Right. So you might burn one area hot, you might do some cool burns to protect your springs and your wetlands before you put bigger fires through. So there's all sorts of different things you need to be doing to manage the fire. Um, yeah, so 70% of all fires occur in the tropical savannas. And um, it's not sort of what you think of when you think of fires, you think of the wildfires. So just before I go into the, the whole fire management story a little bit more, I'll just quickly talk about this road program, what we do. Um, and, sorry, nature needs people. I think it's the same thing that the TSC does in Australia. In the US, we're talking about how, how to get dual, dual outcomes, how to get about the conservation needs of the areas we work, but also livelihoods of people that live in those landscapes. Um, so the, ma the main difference between what TNC does here and what um, we do in Australia is we don't buy land. Um, TNC doesn't own property in, in Australia. It's all about partnerships. So most of our work is done with a wide range of, of those groups um, in the north, particularly with communities, the indigenous rangers, and then some of those other groups as well. Um, and the three things we're trying to do main is um, develop and demonstrate good practice and innovative solutions um, and then find ways to catalyze that to happen at large scale across huge areas because we're a small program but we work across massive areas so we work with the partners that can um, deliver those very good outcomes and because it's communities it's all, especially with traditional owners the indigenous communities it's about empowering and finding ways for them to be able to implement good land management in the long run. So that shows the, that's the boundaries of where we work. So I look after this <laughs> northern Australia, across the north. Um, I live up here in Tans on the coast. We have another, another office over in Darwin. So we spend a lot of time on the phone and complaints. <laughs> visiting people. Uh, we've got an arid lands program. And but the main focus that is with um, another group of traditional landers called the Matu. And they're doing um, similar things in, in, the, in the very dry lands. Um, trying to build conservation capacity as well as um, a livelihood for the people in that very remote country. We now have a really, fairly recently we started a southern sea stamps program, this blue line which is starting off around here, which is restoring shellfish reefs. And that's using experience from the US where that's been done, particularly Washington, Washington states and some others, to do um, uh, a large loss of oyster reefs and um, other shellfish in the southern part of Australia. And no one else has really worked on that. There's been a major focus in Australia, of course, on the barrier reef. Um, make sure that it's healthy. But many other people work on that, so TNC has not into that. And then we have this other Guantanamo Link program, which is this is one of the global biodiversity hotspots for um, woodlands. So we've done some work there with partners as well. And so there, there is some land purchases there. When, Australia, when TNC first moved to Australia in 2004, the model then was to work with some uh, local partners who, do, who look up the land. So, Bush Heritage and a couple of other 
groups who buy and manage land, similar to what TNC does here, and TNC supported some of those purchases in the early years to get started. And then we moved beyond that to, to the whole landscape approach. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons it's important is 85% of the species in Australia are only found in Australia, so um, it's the only place you can look after them. And they are All right, so the North Australia program. So again, our major focus in that northern part is with the, the Aboriginal communities who now own 40% of the land. Um, so our, our approach is all about helping them think about how to manage the land and getting the capacity to do so effectively. So TNC has a process called conservation action planning Heard of. Um, so that was that's the process of thinking through what's your vision for the land, where you're trying to, what are your threats, what are your opportunities, um, what are you trying to achieve, and how to get there. And so that was adapted to work with local communities. Um, it's now called Health and Country Planning. It's Aboriginal people, people call their land their country, and the country means their the land, their culture, um, the food, everything is they sort of see as a as a combined unit. So, and they talk about the country being healthy. So after working th through um, healthy country planning, many groups have been able to declare indigenous, indigenous protected areas. So that's a voluntary declaration of an area that says we're going to manage this large area for conservation purposes, but also make some livelihood, some life from it. And then the government has the government has recognised those into the National Reserve System, so they're recognised as part of the National Reserve System, and there has been some funding available to manage the country. So that's been one way of getting conservation across huge areas and um, enabling people to manage their own land and achieve their, their um, objectives. So that's just, an example, that's just an example of some of the areas where we've helped get established through through helping people through the planning process and through getting their, their management capacity in place. So it's starting to get into some pretty large areas. So but like those these ones over here. I think those that group is about five million hectares, so twelve million acres of um, land is now in active management and being well managed with fire. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of fire that groups are trying to achieve. That's the low intensity early dry season fire. Um, so you just creep through, the, creep through the landscape, not too wild, doesn't burn the overstory, and leaves lots of little niches for animals to live. So it's the fire management, it's for multiple, multiple purposes. So biodiversity benefits, um, Asset protection, so burn areas to protect assets, or fences, houses, all that sort of thing. Um, control weeds, um, but also for livelihoods. So we've been working on finding ways to generate income out of fire management, which is an interesting story, which I'll tell you. Um, there's, there's, this is, a lot of this land is very marginal for any other use. So there's some areas where people have got their land back and be able to do grazing make some income from ranching, but um, many of these areas are failed cattle properties. So it's how do you how do you manage these in the long term with um, without relying on government funding forever, which is not going to come. So we're trying to find ways of helping people to generate income and um, and have a permanent management capacity. So the example I'll just go to one example of um, Fish River Station where one of the first places TNC started working. So it's in the Northern Territory. It's 180,000 hectares, or about 400,000 acres property, which is a typical size property up there. And it was a property that was a cattle property, but um, wasn't very productive and sold. So TNC combined with uh, several other 
organisations and the Australian government bought it. And um, it's now held by the Indigenous Land Corporation, or managed by the traditional owners of the area. With the ultimate aim of um, the land being handed back to those traditional owners for long-term management. So there's four, four language groups with that. And that's some of the old people that are um, responsible for the land. They're, they're people that hold the knowledge and the, the custodian of that land. So because it was a cattle grazing property, there was a history of high, higher frequency. So if you look at the graph, the, the red and yellow colours, the very reddest ones burned every year, so they were 10 years between 2000 and 2009. So some of that land was burned every year in a hot fire. Um, other areas, so most of the areas burned more than six times in the 10 years. So that's, that's not a great situation. A lot of those fires are hot fires late in the season. So that tends to burn, so it's burning up the crowns of the trees and killing a large part of the vegetation. So re establishing the dry season fire management gives you all sorts of benefits. It gives you biodiversity benefits and um, it also gives you the, the income that's been able to be generated through that is through um, reducing the amount of carbon that's going into the air because um, the, hot the late season fires release huge amounts of um, greenhouse gases uh, carbon dioxide and methane you can change it to an early dry season burn um, you drastically cut down on that and you can get some credits but i'll show you that um, so a lot of fire management is done by 